Today we have Jeffrey Hammond, Principal Analyst from Forrester Research. Nice to be in here, Jeffrey. My pleasure. Bring your own device or BYOD has become a very hot topic, and recently you released seven steps to managing that process. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do is you need to think about the people that you're mobilizing. Uh, it's, it's very important, and you know I think one of the easiest things to do is to survey your employees and ask them what kind of devices they're sure. using. I mean, it, it's not rocket science here. And it's pretty easy to look at your web traffic if you've got people trying to browse your site and see what kind of devices people are using, or you can even do customer surveys. And you may end up seeing that, gee, you know, 80% of the devices that our employees are using are either iPhones or Androids, or they're iPhones or RIM devices. Well, that gives you some really good insight into the types of devices that you need to support. But you should go beyond that, and you should really ask them uh, a very simple question. What do you need to do when you're out of your office? Now, that doesn't mean necessarily out of the building. It means physically out of their office or cubicle. Because what you find is when people are outside of their cubicle, we all know that it takes probably 10 minutes for us to turn our laptops on and get them all booted up and log in and go through the VPN and then get email, okay? So the reality is, is when somebody's walking around or they're in a conference room, they're going to reach for a tablet first or they're going to reach for a mobile phone first. So by answering that simple question, you start to get uh, to the insight about the kinds of things that you need to mobilize. And you're not going to mobilize every single app that you've ever built, you know, your rich client apps, or your web apps. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to have the resources to do that. So by finding out what people do when they're out of their office or what customers do when they're out of their home, you start to prioritize that need. Now, before you start acting on that need, uh, from an employee standpoint, one of the things that you want to think about is the classes of devices that you're going to support. And I generally recommend that three classes. There are, are essentially unsecured devices. By default, all your customers are going to have unsecured devices because you can't tell them, well, we want to have remote wipe access over your phones. Not going to happen, okay? Uh, and at the top tier, there's, you know, essentially company uh, liable devices that you will highly secure. In between, there's this uh, idea of a lightly managed device. And it's a device that uh, you might secure the applications on. You might provide some sort of login to the corporate portal or something like that. But you're essentially not managing the device, the hardware itself. Uh, one of the biggest reasons you need that tier is if you have a supply chain of partners, you might want to be building apps for them someday. And those apps might contain sensitive information. And so uh, you're going to want to maintain some sort of control over them. But again, your partners are not going to give you remote wipe access uh, over their employees' devices. It's just not going to happen. Happen. So start with those three tiers. You can certainly add more. Uh, at the third step, take the information that you've learned uh, from your segmentation work and start to build out your portfolio. Uh, you know, what are the tier one projects that we need to work on that are going to have the largest impact across our company or the largest impact with our clients uh, that address the most pressing mobile needs that people have? Then what are tier two? Then what are tier three? What you'll often find is providing basic email access and uh, portal access and uh, uh, you know, the capability to, to get the, to the contacts uh, book uh, for all employees is going to provide an immediate productivity impact. Then you're going to find that there are specific applications, maybe mobile BI for executives. Right. That's a common need that we see uh, that has a real impact to the company overall. Um, once you get to that point, you're ready to start developing some apps, and you might be buying some apps, but you're going to be doing custom dev for, uh, for the rest. Assuming that you found that your employees are, you know, like every other company, and they're using multiple devices, you know, some are using uh, Androids, and some are using iPhones, and some are using RIM devices, you're going to have to master multi-platform development. Because what you're going to find is if you try to build native apps for all those needs, uh, your development costs are going to go sky high, uh, your maintenance costs are going to go sky high, and not many organizations that I run into are prepared to pay 200 or 300 percent of their current development costs to do the client parts of their platforms. Right. So you got to master multi-platform development. Next step, uh, you got to refund your network. Uh, we see the architectures behind these multi-channel, multi-platform mobile apps very different uh, than traditional SOAP-based SOA architectures and you know ESBs and you know all the uh, kind of. Uh, 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 SAML type security assertions and that sort of thing. So you got to look at things like uh, an API gateway. Uh, you got to look at things like uh, uh, you know doing uh, cross device notification. A lot of the services uh, that uh, you know connect to these clients that you're building and turn the app into a connected experience. 
Um, you also have to uh, be able to uh, change your employee reimbursement policies. If people are bringing their own devices, they've paid for their own devices, so at least you don't have the capital costs uh, there. Uh, but you've got to set some expectation, well, you know, this is how much we'll pay, or we're going to cap at $100 a month, or you know, here's a, a roaming plan that we're going to support a certain subset of the employees on, and you've got to set tiers, and you've got to set expectations, and you've got to put policy in place uh, so that people know what they're allowed to do. After all that, the last thing I would say take a look at is we're seeing organizations move from an IT push model to an employee pool model when it comes to applications. And to do that, you're going to have to look at app stores. I don't think you're going to want to put all your corporate assets out in the public app stores, you know, the Google Play for, you know, market or, uh, or the, uh, the Apple App Store. And so you really need to look at a, uh, an enterprise or even a uh, partner uh, private app store to deploy those applications that have a little bit more sensitive data or a little bit more sensitive information. So you follow those seven things, uh, you'll be where you need to be. Uh, you're probably not going to get them all done in 2012 or 2013. So uh, you, know, you can plan out a two to three year strategy to get all those pieces in place. What are the key questions a company should ask when they're using a platform to build cross-device mobile apps? Well, I think the first thing that they need to think about is once they've looked at that prioritization and they know the kinds of things that they want to build, they should look at each of those tasks and say, well, what kind of workload is this? And, and let me go into that a little bit. So we generally see three major types of mobile workloads. The first one I would qualify as device centric. So you know, the question I ask is, would I want to you know, use this application or perform this task if I were on an airplane flight from Boston to San Francisco? And I don't have wireless because I'm on you know, American. Uh, uh, you know, if the answer is yes, that's a good example of a device centric workload. The second type of workload would be a, a, a content-centric workload. So uh, Boston Globe is a great example of that. Uh, you know, it's mainly text, some audio and video and pictures, but you know, it's kind of almost a web-style experience, and it's primarily a consumption-based experience. Uh, the third type of workload that we see is what I'd call a connected workload. And a mobile banking application is a great example of a connected workload. If you think about your bank balance, well, your bank balance is getting updated all the time. You know, your wife's taking out an ATM withdrawal. You know, your uh, credit card bills are getting processed because uh, you've got bill pay set up. And that balance is updating all the time. And the source of the truth is somewhere in a server out there in the bank's data center. And your mobile banking app, uh, app is accessing that over the internet. Well, if you're not connected, that workload really doesn't make sense. So I think what organizations will tend to find is they've got different levels of workloads. They may have more content workloads if they're in the media or entertainment industry. Uh, they may have a lot of uh, device-centric workloads uh, if they're doing uh, mobile or field repair, uh, if they're a gaming company. But I think most enterprises are going to find that they have a lot of connected workloads. But you might have all three in, in some proportion. And so you really have to look at a framework or a tool that are going to support the workloads that you have. And so, for example, a middleware platform that supports uh, you know, generation of web apps or hybrid apps or native apps uh, can support those workloads fairly well. If a platform is just going to support generation of native apps, well, then it might be overkill if what you've primarily got are a lot of connected app needs or a lot of content-centric uh, needs. I think you also have to look at the development talent that you have. Uh, if you've got a lot of Java developers or a lot of .NET developers, you know, they're not going to have a lot of JavaScript skills. So if you choose a platform that's going to require a lot of JavaScript knowledge, you're going to see a real lag in productivity as they get up to speed. Um, on the other hand, if you've got tools that are integrated into Eclipse or if they're integrated into Visual Studio, uh, those developers are going to feel right at home. If they've got a visual painter, then they're going to learn how to, you know, very quickly how to paint applications and generate them and, and test things out and, and, and pick stuff up. So you got to look at your devs. Um, then you also have to look at the types of applications you're deploying from a, an execution standpoint. And what I mean by that is if you've got an application where you might be deploying it to 50,000 customers, uh, but only 1,000 customers may be using that at any one point in time in concurrent use, well, then you want a platform that is going to maybe have a server-based license or something like that, as opposed to a platform where you're going to get charged for every single user uh, who downloads that application. On the other hand, if you only have 400 employees that you, uh, that you have to mobilize, then a per employee or a per connection based model uh, might work better or a consumption model. So you really kind of have to look at, at all of those things and then use that uh, to uh, select between the platforms uh, and make sure that you get the, uh, the economic model that works for you. Make sure you get the technology model that works for you and make sure that it can be used to deliver the workloads that you have most effectively.